It's a real pleasure. It was a whole six minute walk from the building around the corner. We're in the Jukebox Avalon building, uh, just on Oxford Road. My role at Cortex is Director of Learner Experience. Um, how many people have heard of Cortex? Yeah, so based on that, thank you very much, that's higher than usual. Um, I probably shouldn't admit that I owned marketing for a year, so that uh, is, is disappointing, but I'll talk about why we strategically targeted certain uh, audiences. Um, my role at the minute, Director of Learning Experience, is looking at end user experiences. As many of you will be aware that um, the user, the end user, and being user-centered is central to many pieces of software now. Um, having been at Winchester University previously, um, is it worth giving a three-minute background as to yeah, career yeah, today? Um, so I actually started in academia, never left university, loved it, absolutely loved it. Did a master's in sports psychology, didn't know what to do at the end, did some hourly paid lecturing, loved it, got offered more hourly paid lecturing, loved that, then got offered lots of promotions to become director of learning and teaching at Winchester University. Um, I think I was youngest by about a decade or something, so I was totally unprepared for what I needed to be able to do the role, but it meant that I was able to understand the learning and teaching experience really um, intricately and uh, the variety that existed within that university. And beyond that, it then taught me how to, um, to empower students and users to help us do things better. And at Winchester, they set up a scheme called Student Fellows where the students could improve the experience on their courses. And it's quite, it sounds quite common sense, but it was quite radical to empower them to make the changes. And what we're now doing at Cortex reflects that, where we're saying, it's no longer what we want to be able to do to, I'll come back to that actually, it's a slightly bigger topic. Um, we no longer want to just speak to a librarian and make sure they're happy. We want to move from that B2B model, working with librarians, going to the end user and being user-centered in our design. So I guess university, never left, loved academia, found ed tech, went to Canvas uh, in Utah for what, nine months and then left me in London for a year. And that's where I then found Cortex CEO James Gray and Andy Alfrox, who said, why don't you cut your two hour commute down to 20 minutes and come and work with us here in Bournemouth? And that's where I've been ever since. So, as, as probably most people aren't familiar with Cortex, could you just give us a, a 30 second, you can take a bit longer if you want, I won't work time you, um, in terms of what Cortex actually, actually does? We provide a personal learning platform for students. Predominantly, we've been doing that with universities directly. Um, a personal learning platform where they can have aggregated digital textbooks provided to them so that they can access them anywhere, anytime, for free, um, as part of their institutional, um, often as part of their institutional fee. And so they sign up to a course, and the NUS charter said there should be no hidden course costs. So if there's a compulsory textbook that you need to have access to, we think that you should be providing that to the students. And Cortex was perfectly positioned to say, right, give every student a digital copy, the publishers will do it cheaper, the student gets a better experience, and the analytics can support student success. Oh, okay, so the days of students going to the bookshop to buy and fill three suitcases with 90 pound books, is that, is that gone? Hopefully. Okay. Excellent. So, so can we talk a little bit about where the idea originally came from? Because I, I was saying to you earlier that when I was doing a bit of research before, I actually knew James and Andy Alfrods 25 years ago when they worked at, a, in effect, a book company in Ringwood called BNNBC. So could you talk us through how that developed and how they came up with the idea of Cortex initially? That would, I think that would be quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so I can't take any credit for the company's um, founding and getting to this point where many of you will be trying to be entrepreneurial and create your own uh, businesses. James Gray um, and Andy Alfarovs, um, along with a few other core staff that they've worked with before, founded Cortex in 2012. But the business you're discussing there or describing, they built up over uh, two decades and then sold to Ingram Contact Group and worked for Ingram for a period of years, I believe around five years, before James saw a gap. And the gap was current providers were working for publishers and making sure that they could 
say to the publishers, you have this content, we'll distribute it into these universities and we'll drop on that. And James thought, actually, if we create an aggregated platform and then we think about the student's user experience first and we try and think about how that can be um, exceptional beyond uh, the current competitors, there's a gap that we could accelerate into. So that was in 2013? 12, 12, 12, 13, 12, 13 yeah. okay. And, and obviously you only joined in 2016, so I'm asking you to talk a little bit about things that, that were a little bit before your time. Mm -hmm. But do you know much about how they got started, what that first couple of years were like before you joined? Have you, have you, have you sort of learnt any insight from that from James's? And, Painful. Um, I think, I think there was quite a lot of challenge. There were um, technical issues where they used outsourced suppliers, where the experience then wasn't the standard that was wanted. And so, I mean, the thing that they're great about, you know, is that they've got this immense network. They knew all the big publishers. They knew key contacts in each of those. So they were able to sign up, you know, the likes of Pierce and McGraw, Miley, and actually make sure that those key textbooks that many of us have read and utilized were available for students. So that was a key strategic thing that they were able to achieve quickly. But then they needed academic partners to help them sustain that, that business in the early days. My understanding is that um, the strong partnership we have with Middlesex, which is one of the biggest schemes of distributing digital textbooks to students in Europe, um, agreed to partner with Cortex and to grow that over a period of time. And so we've been, they're our longest standing partner and they're a full institutional um, scheme, six to eight textbooks for every student um, in each year as they go through. So it's a phenomenal investment and they also are starting to see benefits in both rankings and satisfaction and also student success. Okay, excellent. And, and do you know what employee number you were? <laughs> 33. 33, okay. okay. So, and then just after you joined, they if I'm right, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they sort of started the approach and raised some considerable, not, not inconsiderable sums of money, didn't they? So literally just after you, on around the time you joined me. Yeah, just, <laughs> I think just before I arrived, they'd agreed uh, terms in terms of the first, uh, I guess, a pre-seed uh, around, um, which is around 2.4, that allowed them to recruit key personnel to grow certain parts of the business. Um, and then, uh, beginning of this year, we were able to close uh, 6.2 in order to be able to scale internationally, accelerate roadmap, and largely to become much more um, established and clearly the UK leading supplier into the universities, which we are. So, how many employees do you, do you have now? 90. 90. So, you've trebled in two years? Yeah. Okay. So, South Africa's quite fun, I imagine. It, it comes with some challenges, yeah. So I think the beauty of it is that it's really great to be part of these stories that grow and that are like, oh, this is amazing. But I've been part of other stories that have grown and that have failed as well, um, which is um, it's a different experience when you've gone through the growth and seen the failure. You're constantly kind of being more uh, aware um, of things that you wouldn't have been before. And the beauty of their experience in business is that there's so much backing up that growth. So it's not just 90 and crash, it's gonna be 90 and 180 and we're looking to double uh, regularly. But I think the pain comes with growing so quickly is that you need to put in different structures. You can't just have a team of 34 and it's flat. It has to have certain structures where you can uh, optimize uh, development, make sure you're becoming agile and how you're creating product and all of those things yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing journey, like it's great to be on that journey with them but there are really good challenges to overcome together as a team. So, so as, you've, as you've been through that journey and seen success and seen failure, do you do you think you're more aware of keeping an eye out for the alerts? So for example, one of my old chairmen always used to say Whenever he went into a startup office, if he saw a fish tank in reception, he'd get quite worried. So he always thought that if he saw a fish tank in reception for any organisation that had less than 20 people, his view was that they were probably doomed for failure within 12 months. And he sort of became aware of these signals that these startups would sort of send out yeah. that, that would indicate failure. Is that something you think you're a bit cognizant of? Do you keep an eye out for them, sort of more jams? You think, oh, 
we can't have a fish tank sort of thing. I definitely turned down the fish tank idea. That was, you know, off the tape now. Um, I think there's, there's lots of things that people think they should have as a starter to make it, to make the culture right. Um, fish tank would be one. Yeah. I think probably, you know, I love the setup here with the table tennis and the pool table, but actually, when you're really scrapping, you know, yes, the previous company I had had all of this in London and it was, you know, really, it was quite exciting, nice culture. But if you don't have the fundamentals right in the business and you don't know how, you know, the EBITDA is going to work out and how we're going to be able to raise future rounds and you're not thinking through those next three, four steps, um, it falls apart quite quickly. And so it's really good to understand the balance of things in a different way. So I, I wouldn't mind if there was a fish tank in our company because, you know, I've got the confidence that we could maintain fish food and those sorts of things. But do we need it? And it's kind of like Jeff Bezos is famously photographed going back when he started Amazon with the, the door cut apart and stapled together with, you know, um, bits of wood just to make a table. It's like, what do you need to invest in to make the user experience the best it can be? and then work back from there and actually grow, grow the culture around the experience. And so do you think the culture that, that you had in place when you were 33 people, 34 people, is the thing that's enabled you to grow faster? And, and if so, what were those? I mean, everybody talks about culture and, you know, and having things on the walls and we're all patient and calm and we work hard and all that. Not very nice stuff. But there are some fundamental things that you said that if you're not in place, that the company can falter and, and fail. So what, what what sort of culture, cultural aspects do, do Cortex have that you think is giving you that basis for, for growth? I think um, the ability to structure a company so that people can feel secure and safe and that you know they're, they're coming to a job that's going to still be there in 6-12 months, we know in startup world is one of the key considerations people think about, especially in younger companies. Um, and I guess the, the feeling of team, family, trying to make sure that people feel like they're being cared for together and that you embed that within the activities you do, the company days you do, trying to get families together. Um, we're all running around Lindhurst in different coloured t-shirts, doing activities with some of our family members back in, in July when it was actually still beautifully sunny. And those sorts of things where it's, I mean, you create what you want your company to exhibit and be. And I think one of the things that comes through for me in Cortex is that feeling of team, that feeling of family. Um, lots of them have worked together previously, but actually there's new talent that we've recruited where we've spotted gaps to allow us to continue accelerating that's also added diversity and allowed us to really um, celebrate the differences as well. Um, it would be really nice to get a table tennis table at some point in the next six months. I think we've worked hard. I think we're probably at that stage where the dining table could double up as a table tennis table. And so, do you, do you have a, a common picture of where the company's going and how it's going to get there? Is that shared? Is it a little bit secret? How does that, how does that Very happen? secret. I can't talk about it at okay. all. That's fine. <laughs> I think, you know, how many people are running their own business or starting their own business or heading up their own business? Lots of you. So you'll all be quite aware of the power of being strategic and actually understanding kind of in the kind of chess master way, thinking six steps ahead and going, okay, so if I do this, this and this and then the competitors don't react to that point, then we've got them. And um, when I worked for Canvas, which was a BLE company in America, that the underpinning fundamentals were strategic advantage. And when I researched them before I joined, I noticed that they had cloud server, um, software service, one set of code, 150 engineers looking at it. They were going to accelerate faster than Blackboard that had poor reputation, multiple installs on sites as well as trying to develop a cloud service to compete. And it, you knew it was gonna happen, it was inevitability and getting those strategic advantages where we can in our businesses or uh, when we're competing in a competitive market is, is one of the key things that I think we're thinking about, uh, how we can scale faster than companies that are well-established, billion-dollar revenue, um, and uh, compound that with end users as well. 
where the platform benefits anyone who wants to learn. Anyone can have practice content, and anyone can engage with other content that they find online. So, so that's, that's an interesting point, because I think it, it's very challenging to provide a service to both a, a business and, in effect, a, a consumer. And you're sort of trying to do both, aren't you? So they're, they're very different customers who have very different needs, at very different price points, and probably want quite different solutions. So what sort of, what's some of the challenges that you've had building out those fun, fundamentally sort of different propositions, aren't they? Yes and no. So yes, yeah, so the different proposition is that we're marketing directly to students uh, as opposed to librarians. So a lot of our marketing, tone of voice, our messaging, that's all very different. And actually, um, we're looking at our personas and thinking how can we make it slightly more inclusive so that we don't have to do too granular messaging. But actually, if you think about the library's customer is not customer. I hate that tone, uh, that word around students, but partners in learning, um, are students. So students um, ultimately have an experience through our B2B contracts, and they have an experience when they come directly and create an account directly with us. And it's that experience that I believe is the thing that we're prioritizing above our competitors, but that we can benefit both B2B and B2C channels, because the end user is still the librarians. If they have hundreds of students saying, Oh, I'm not enjoying this and this is rubbish, then they will come back to us and say something similar. But if we get direct users and B2B users, we are benefiting both by enhancing and putting user centered design at the heart. Uh, was that a, a strategic move to focus on students because outside of the UK or out of other countries, the universities aren't obliged to provide the texts so you can go straight to the UD, uh, students in that case? Was that the thinking or is it something? something else there as well. So, um, as director of learning teacher, I knew that one of the pain points was that students didn't ever have their own space to learn in, so they didn't, there's so much content out there. If I was writing an essay, I had loads of PDFs stored on my desktop, I'd have to open each one, pull across bits of content that I wanted to use, paraphrasing, etc. And there was no real research experience that was being prioritized within the VLEs or the other software systems that were institutional systems. So what uh, Cortex does differently is looks at the individual personal learning experience and says, well, all of that content out there, whether that's digital textbooks from the publishers that we know, whether that's other content we found online, whether it's open educational resources that are exploding right now, those areas and content you want to be able to pull in as the individual researcher. And the beauty of doing it in our platform so you can highlight, make notes, um, use read aloud, those sorts of tools that allow you to kind of engage with your content smarter and make notes for when you're doing your essays or your exam revision, then you can actually, hopefully assessments are becoming more diverse than that, but you know, traditionally they're the main two. Um, but you get this, this development um, where the student feels like they've got their own space to be able to do that researching. And that didn't exist really before. And you'd have piles of photocopied journal articles and if you could find the books in the library, those books. And now, actually, you can get most of the content that you want to online, whether that's through your library provision or through Google or other places, which uh, uh, offer content for you. But to pull any of that content in and engage with it in a similar way, to highlight the key bits, to make notes around the bits that you want to in incorporate elsewhere, didn't exist. Okay. So, so, but when you were thinking about going to consumer, did, did this company called Amazon sort of appear anywhere and you thought, actually, we're going, to, we're going to have to take them on in any way, or was it just not even relevant? So I did a quick search on your, yeah. on your store. I thought, I wonder how many books I can find in your store on Amazon. Now, I know the experience is not the same, but to me, it, it, did, it, did it enter your head at all that you thought you sort of, you have to compete with them in any way, or was it just not even relevant? Amazon. <laughs> Uh, rings a bell. I think they're, rings in, a bell. I think they're in Seattle. So, <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're very aware of Amazon. Um, I mean, the power here is, again, it's looking at the strategic advantage. If what we've done is created a lot of university students who are using Cortex because their institutions have already given them textbooks through us, a lot of students then have seen the platform and engage with it and are able to then say, oh, well, I've already got some books here, or if I want to get more books, I can, but if I want to pull other content in that doesn't cost, I can also do that. And so, it's... 
and have that same ability for it to build into hopefully assessments in the future. <laughs> what a quote. Yeah, we're taking on Amazon. Um, I, th I think we want to be brave and courageous and definitely look at that, but ultimately all the best athletes, Michael Jordan included, I was a big basketball player in my, in my young years, but they always focus on what they could do better and what you know they could actually focus on as their strengths. And I think that's what makes hopefully even where we are in our development against Amazon's valuation, etc., gives us some controllable perspective and uh, relativity. Yeah, don't, don't get me wrong, I think, I think what I mean is that, I'm going to make myself very clear, is that you, so even though you know it's there, I think a lot of people who are thinking about starting up or yeah. thinking about going to promotion would sort of think, actually, no, we can't do that because Amazon are doing it, therefore we don't even try. Whereas what you're doing is, you know, you're very focused on what your USPs are, you're controlling the controllables, which is, you know, control what you can control and don't worry about anything else, you know, you're just ploughing that furrow in the route that you see fit, which I think is, is exactly what you need to do. Uh, absolutely, and that's, I, I think for me, that is a key element around why we're different. But James actually says this brilliantly, and it was one of the things that recruited me to the company, is that if you look at what's happening in all platforms, to some extent, there is a consolidation that's happening globally, and you're not going to have 400 aggregators of content. It will come down to probably about five. And so you don't need to be necessarily number one to have a really, really successful business. But if your USP is strong enough, you can accelerate in a way that competitors you know, basically aren't aware or thinking you necessarily that helps. So let's talk about the, the internationalization a little bit. What's that meant for you? Language challenges? Quite a lot of travel. Do, uh, yeah. Are, 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 are um, language challenges? We have had some language um, uh, development work that's been needed. There's a lot of um, requirements when you go internationally that didn't necessarily exist in the UK, so taking on some of those is really important. Um, but you also have to understand the educational systems that you're going into. You know, not everyone is trying to do a similar model of higher education that we do here. They're in different places in terms of what they're prioritising or the economic needs that they have. And so um, it's being able to be context relevant, and that's the power of, I guess, I guess personalised learning, is that there are quite a few of us around the world that are always learning and hopefully looking to learn more. And there's a ton of content, and so being able to find really good quality content that you can learn from, with or without tuition, however you choose to learn, but the ability for that to then feed into your lifelong learning pathway, wherever that then takes you, I think is a really key area that not many people are really focused on. And so where has your internationalisation led you so far? Have you, have you done it by continent? Have you chosen English-speaking countries? Have you thought through that and attacked it? So not, not always. Our, our, one of our biggest announcements was that we um, are, are the partner of the Egyptian Knowledge Bank, which is a national uh, library that they've created, a national digital library, a bit like uh, our British Library has a digital copy of everything. Um, but they actually are making theirs available to every citizen and we're a partner for them where a piece of content selected for it to be able to open through Cortex uh, and for them to engage with it in that experience. So that's the first, I guess, countrywide um, opportunity that we've got. That sparked lots of other conversations, um, which we're ongoing and having lots of conversations about the benefits. Um, uh, there's a big conference um, in January where lots of ministers of education are interested in uh, macro level scale projects. Um, and one of the ideas here is about what can countries do if you look at the um, uh, alumni contributions and endowments that some prestigious universities like Harvard, Oxford, etc. have, they're phenomenal. You know, they're such um, insane amounts of money that whole countries, including the whole of the UK outside Boxbridge, I think, would struggle to have any sort of endowment that comes anywhere near a single institution. And then um, to think about whole countries saying, well, the endowments are more than you know what we're investing in education full stop, then there becomes a situation where you have to say, how can we leapfrog somehow? We're not going to have infrastructure wired in 
in our country necessarily. We're not going to have uh, desktops put in everywhere. Everyone's got to mobile and Wi-Fi. So we can leapfrog in that respect and not do great research or great um, learning with access to that content. And what about um, the rise of MOOCs and Coursera? And what, what about these guys? Do you see that as, is it threat? Is it opportunity? Where, where does that fit into your strategic view, vision? Always opportunity, always. Don't, don't we all just see opportunity the whole time? No? Everyone? No? Oh. So, FutureLearn has been in the press recently saying that they want to raise 40 million round. Okay, so you look at it and you think, oh, well, that's a lot of money. What are they offering? They've got 7.1 million users of their MOOCs. MOOCs are notoriously bad retention rate in terms so, of Does everyone know what a MOOC is? Massive so, open online course. So they've got hundreds of thousands of people doing an autonomous learning pathway through this content, which has assessments and other things built into it. And it's great. On some level, it's used for marketing, so people do a taster of the subject area before they then try and get converted or um, recruited onto a fuller program. Um, but there are things that are being layered in now. So FutureLearn, for instance, has now got an upgrade button. So if you do that pathway, you can pay £32 and get a certificate that says you've done that pathway. And that's then able to be put on LinkedIn and lots of other things that are happening. But that's happening all over the place. So MOOCs are growing, but also different online provision of educational experiences like Xbox as well, uh, the small professional online courses. Um, some of them are really expensive, but the experience you're getting is more supported, you get more contact, it's not autonomous, you're just doing it through the pathway. Um, but the opportunities exist all over the place. So a lot of learning, uh, I'm going to call them learning pathways, those learning pathways that MOOCs create, they allow anyone to be able to learn that pathway of content. Now, whether that includes digital content written by the teacher, <coughs> whether that includes published content by an author or a publication house, or whether that's um, open educational resources, learning pathways will be created with all sorts of content in the future, and they already are with a, a wide diversity. Those opportunities exist for us to be able to play a role in creating a personal learning experience for that user that allows them to have the content um, no matter what they're learning. So whether it's a formal course or whether it's their own autonomous learning and they're just interested, the platform allows them to keep all of their learning content in one space. And so you're doing all of this, all of this internationalization, all this opportunity from an office that's just over... There. Five minutes that way. There. Yeah. And have you guys got, is it one office that you're doing online for the moment? So we've got satellites anywhere? Or? Yeah, we've got tons of stuff all over the place. So uh, the office hasn't grown. You've got uh, people in Boscombe, people like that? Are you thinking bigger? <laughs> <laughs> we've got um, Croatia, Singapore, Canada, London, uh, Sweden. Um, yeah, people all over the, uh, Portugal, lots of places around the world where we've got both developers. Um, and, and people who are relocating and choosing to work elsewhere in the world because we, we can now, can't we? So the technology's there for us to work wherever we are. And, and do, you, do you have a team yourself? Have, yeah. Have, is your yeah. team very spread? Uh, so I arrived with one person. We're now up to about 11 people in my team. And we largely look over um, user experience and design. Um, SEO, uh, organic SEO is one of the important bits for us. Um, and uh, marketing and connecting with product as well. So how we actually communicate what's being developed, how we're developing it, and um, just trying to make sure that, um, I mean, it sounds a bit, uh, a bit corny, but actually to, to grow and delight our users. So if we can actually get to the point where people love the experience, um, which we're working towards constantly and to, get, to make that even better, um, the previous company I got to, we were able to see the power of that, where it was solving a problem, but the user experience was amazing. Um, when it actually did go under, it was 8,000 users a day it was signing up. And so when you get it right, we know that the power is in the word of mouth that comes from students going, that's phenomenal, I don't know why you're not using it. And so, so to, the, to the consumers, to the, to the students, sorry, I can't yeah. see it. Sorry, to the students, do you sell one? Do you, do you sell um, one book at a time? 
Would you offer a subscription, like a recurring revenue model, or is it, is it one offs? Yeah, at this point, it's just content if you want to buy more and the platform is uh, free, so you can create an account and have the platform for free, but if you want to buy more content, you yeah. can. Um, and is your team spread? Uh, my, my, most of my team are between London and here. Okay, All right. so that's not a, that's around um, conversion of users coming through the, through the site and also um, SEO. But there are really exceptional people here. We've hired like five or six interns from BU and Arts University of Bournemouth. And like, one's written two books, one's an award-winning designer and illustrator. You know, there is some phenomenal talent right here in Bournemouth. Um, and I've, I've been amazed actually at um, both the quality, but also the, the acceleration it's offered the business. So certain roles, you, you point and you think, okay, well, that would be a good job to get done. And what they do above and beyond is, is incredible and it's taken us to a very different place. So what do the next six to 12 months hold for, for your team first and then for, for Cortex team? Um, I mean, we're going to just get really, um, I won't say intimate with students because that's not quite the right word, but we're going to get really um, uh, engaged with students through user research, user testing, making sure that the elements of the experience that until now may be certain elements we've assumed are the experience, and actually we're just going to have that data really reinforce that that is the best experience that they could be having. So we're going to be doing lots of um, user um, research with students. Uh, my team is going to, I, I suspect, we're planning for it to continue growing over the next six months. Um, and we currently have a couple of roles out at the minute as um, uh, a graphic designer and we've got another role for growth hacking, so a couple of uh, key, key eyes that we're still making. Um, so my team continue growing and hopefully focus much more on um, how we can make both the proposition more powerful, punchy, and uh, promoted, but then also the user experiences devising the people who actually use it. So that, that's the key thing for my, my team. And for the company more broadly, I think international scaling is, is going to continue at pace. Um, the recruitment of developers is ever accelerating for many companies, and I think there is some, some shortages in certain skill sets um, around uh, certain code bases locally, but actually internationally there's also evidence that some code bases are quite new and um, advanced and actually there's still lots of people developing into them. Um, but recruiting is key, you absolutely have to have the right talent to allow the, the company to scale, so we're pulling out all the stops to get the right people for the right roles. Okay, so, any questions? Adam, yes sir. So you've come from 33 to 90 odd people. How have you handled like the changes in the culture within the business? Because different people bring you know different things to that culture. How have you managed to keep everybody on the same sort of culture wagon that you started, or has that changed as you've gone along? Or? Uh, it's definitely changed. I think the culture when we arrived was very um, it was quite focused and very. I don't want to say. Um, uh, I don't know quite how to describe it. It was just super, super focused. There wasn't a tremendous amount. They had a, a wonderful thing called Fat Fridays where uh, during my interview actually, I was delivered fish and chips, which was quite surreal. Um, but uh, enjoying fish and chips on a Friday and just getting the people in the office to share a meal together you know, at least once a week in that way. It's that sort of thing about family that I was talking about earlier, which was nice. Um, but then there are other, you know, there are other things that have happened which have forced the company to reflect on, you know, how do we onboard people? How do we get people to feel part of something quickly, especially when they're remote? You know, how do we actually prioritise um, people at distance rather than being in the office? And if you do, has anyone been at a meeting where they're not in the room but they're actually online listening? I mean, that can be dire, you know, for lots of people. And so we've had to really transform some of those practices so that it's not always reliant on who's in the room, but actually where the talent is being able to contribute uh, equitably. Um, we've also had great uh, benefits from it, where we've done um, fairly wacky things, I guess. Um, going to um, the Girl Guys place in Lindhurst was a bit 
surreal where we went and did geolocation puzzles. You know, that was just a, a random idea from one of our most recent recruits. So, and, and listening, I guess, across that organization is the hardest thing. It's being able to hear the frustrations when they occur before they become too big and someone spins out. And, you know, that, we haven't always got that right. I think maybe two people have left in the last year for really great opportunities elsewhere, but... Um, that wasn't right for the business and you had to somehow sort of manage them out or does it really, has your hiring always been that spot on that you've never... Mine has. My hiring has always been that spot on. I don't think we've ever had a situation to manage them out. I think we've had, I mean, it's still relatively early days and a lot of time goes into the recruitment because obviously getting the wrong role at this point um, or you know, someone who's not going to be right for the company at this point can have quite a detrimental impact, I think, um, to lots of things. So lots of people meet every person before we actually hire. Um, and the beauty of, you know, having, we have like three month internships with students while they're at the university, but having some of those students come in and do three month internships then convince the business that actually we don't have a role necessarily right now, but we need to find a role because they're talented and they can actually do these things that would allow us to accelerate in this way. So when we find people who are just amazing talents, we just try and create a space. Actually, uh, so you, you talk about scaling and growing and that all sounds very attractive but presumably it's not as easy as just doing it so for instance if you're going to uh, become the preferred supplier for the um, Egyptian library yeah. then how do you go about trying to get that business so presumably the growth is dependent on getting you more business kind of how targeted can you be how challenging is it what sort of approach do you take to making that succeed so I won't take much credit for the EKB thing. I would say that, again, is, is down to um, James Gray's genius and the ability for him to kind of um, hear people, listen to the opportunities where they exist, but also understand how the opportunities complement and align with where we're trying to head. Um, and I think what he's been able to do and what Andy and others as well at the company who've been there a long time have been able to do is to sell partnership actually not to sell necessarily a finished polished product there you go have it because at the beginning that wasn't what existed and so what they've really been able to do is say no one will partner you stronger and listen to what you need more no one's going to offer you the support you know and be more passionate about it succeeding and and to this point we've had you know 100 percent retention of people who've actually started a scheme with us or partnered us to do a scheme, whether that's at EKB country level or if that's down to a, a single cause. That, and I think that speaks volumes to the, the ability to sell the partnership and to say we'll be a trusted partner to get, you know, in, a, in the future to a long... I think the challenge for a lot of people here would be uh, how do you get to have that conversation with the people in the first place in order for them to be able to partner? So is that like a hard-nosed sales strategy or are you just networking all the time? How do you get those conversations going in the first place? Yeah, we're all prolific networkers. <laughs> I think... <laughs> it wouldn't fit in one book. But um, the, the, the whole point here is that um, opportunities exist in every conversation. And I think that's where, you know, uh, networking can feel very like, intentional. And that's quite uncomfortable. But where you're actually just curious, where you're actually interested in what someone's context is, it's amazing what a 20 minute conversation and a cup of coffee or a drink or something will allow to come to the surface without necessarily having a sales pitch or having a debt to go through on your phone or anything like that. Nothing too intentional, but just being interested in thinking, oh, actually, I'm, you know, there's been three conversations I've had tonight. And so, oh, you've got to speak to them if you're interested in blockchain or crypto or anything like that. And it just, it just passion and curiosity, I think, spark opportunities. And for anyone who's met James, you, you'll get the, you know, you kind of get it straight away. Like, he's really... He's an amazing, um, he's an amazing person. But what you, you see is that he's able to hear where people have a pain point and find the pain point. And actually, if it's online, great. There might be an opportunity for having a further conversation about how we could build something together. 
And if it's not, then it's, you know, ouch. <laughs> James, yeah, um, what, what's been your experience of running a startup in um, I think it's been great. I mean, I haven't been here from the very beginning, but my uh, my experiences with other people in the, the network, and I came to, to previous startup grind events, as well as working with the universities very closely. We've been on campuses at career fairs and those sorts of things. What I'm struck by, you know, we're staying through from work. We can get anywhere we need to. And I think everyone that we've recruited from Bournemouth, either from the university or locally, has been exceptional and has stayed at the company um, for the, well, since I've joined. Did you think there's anything missing? Oh, system? what can we do better? Yeah, I guess, I guess, have you heard of like corridor conversations or corridor spaces? Those spaces where you just, you end up just hanging out or you end up just going to get uh, the, the cooler machines that they say in America, you know, you go and get some water and you end up speaking to someone that you wouldn't ordinarily be working with. The ability to connect with people in informal spaces and to go and find out about interesting things a bit like this. Um, maybe much more interesting things, but, uh, or more interesting speakers, but you could actually, you know, create uh, a nice network where people could do, um, have dinner at your house, dinner, but you know, we could go to different places around Bournemouth to connect dots. We could network much better, I think, and have, is there like a, not a just mail list, but um, an online forum for us to be able to converse and share ideas and engage in that way? Maybe there will be tomorrow. Excellent, great idea. Um, I'll, get, I'll get right on it. Um, I, I just think connecting people. I think if you get great time to people who are interested around something or curious or passionate, and you just give them the space to connect, space and time. At Winchester, Ref Me, Canvas, the best ideas came when people had space and time, reflected on something without pressure of a, a number or a target, but just actually had some time to reflect. And then things change, whether that's a more efficient process, whether that's a communication link, whether that's recruitment. Those things can shift with a, a single conversation. That's what I've always prioritised, I guess. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I've got a straightforward question. I see you as a pure play platform. Um, which is more important to you? Consumers, providers, or... Because uh, you're the owner of the platform, you basically set the rights of the, the rights of engagement. But... Who is your target audience, really? Are you asking me personally or the company? No, no, just in terms of this. I, I think it's learners. I think our, our essence and the core is about people who want to learn. And that could, whether that's a student in a university, whether that's someone retraining, whether that's someone um, doing a MOOC or doing another path. Well, you go to market historically. Yes, yeah, B2B has been our predominant market uh, or channel to institutional sales. It's not saying we're stopping that, just in case anyone's taken that wrong. The institutional relationship and the B2B is not stopping. So we are going to continue doing that and accelerating it. But there are universities where we don't have any students using us because there hasn't been an institutional deal. And so what we have now is a benefit where we can have the institutional uh, schemes and opportunities occur and, and accelerate. But it means that we can have students sign up autonomously where the value is there for them. And so in ref uh, previous company I was at, I was doing B2B sales on the back of B2C data. Sure. So 2,800 students at your university are already using us. Why wouldn't you want to support all the students? Doesn't that then Thank you. 
gig, but otherwise you're going to have two distinct competing propositions. Keeping the platform in, in line is any, is any propositions would be more challenging. I, I definitely hear what you're saying. I think um, there is a challenge in it. Um, in essence, the core experience is the end learner accessing content. The benefit for an institution above the end user is that they're able to engage with analytics that say, actually, we've provided this book at $25 pounds and we've sent it to 400 students and three of them have used it. Actually, that's a massive cost for us. No one's used from it. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you're in a business and you haven't failed, I think you're lying. But um, <laughs> for us, we, we've had failures that aren't um, devastating but are irritating. You know, you do something where um, inevitably an email drops or a thread drops, and then suddenly, you know, it's too late. You're going to be doing that, you know, that week, and it's, you can't prepare for it anymore. Those sorts of small level things are irritating. Slightly bigger irritating things are where you develop into a certain direction and then having done that technology shifts or the algorithm shifts or something changes and suddenly you have to not necessarily unpick everything but you have to try and follow um, I mean Google's SEO algorithm is a, is a great one you know so oh we're going mobile first now are we excellent okay so let's think about what we have to do from the development side and, and from an SEO side and combine that change and think about how we can shift, but that's inevitably additional work that we weren't factoring in, um, which shifts roadmap, right and that's frustrating as well because then we've got other things that we wanted to, to develop, but I think the whole time while we're scaling, it's about saying, let's be really focused and try and minimize those errors as much as possible by communicating really efficiently across the business. And I think that's the hardest thing as we grow, is to maintain really good, efficient communication lines as the business has grown and we've got these separate teams now growing. Um, when tool, everyone's around the kitchen tables. What tools do you use for that? Uh, well, Slack is our main one. So a lot of the developers, engineers, marketing, um, product use Slack. Zendesk is growing in terms of customer support and being able to work with people and end users when they're having issues. Um, so communication in and communication within. Um, and then we've got Google for Business and other things that allow us to have document sharing, collaborative work, and those sorts of things. Is that cool? Yeah. Any other questions? No? Excellent. Well, I'd just like to thank you very much for coming. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I think there are some beers left. Maybe. There are. There are some beers left. Okay. Feel free if anyone has any questions, I'll stick around and you can come and grab me. But if not, and you need to peel off, then LinkedIn or Twitter or somewhere, grab, grab it through there. All right? Thanks a lot.